One of the most upsetting group diving catastrophes we have yet to cover on our channel will be featured in today's video. Nine divers went diving the shaft, a shallow entry cave, where many of them ran into problems as they dove deeper than they intended and battled to surface. On farmland on the eastern part of Allendale, some kilometers south of Mount Gambier, Australia, a cave was found in Thompson's paddock as early as 1938. The cave is called the Shaft. When a horse slipped over a one-foot-wide hole while grazing in the field, it was discovered. The surface of this recently discovered hole has to be enlarged to around 3.3 feet in diameter for the purpose of further exploration. Until divers started exploring it, it was unknown that it was an entrance to a bigger underground cavern. In the middle of the 1960s, a local diver visited this field, and much to his utter surprise, when he descended the tiny hole, he arrived at a vast lake cave with a depth of around 56 feet. He started to dive down, and eventually got to a depth of roughly 69 feet. The main cavern is approximately 460 feet long and 260 feet wide. The majority of the time that you are in the cave, the water is roughly 23 feet below the surface. You can see a rock pile just beneath the cave's entrance. It is down there inside the cave. From the region around the rock pile, two tunnels lead deeper into the cave. The tunnel to the east is approximately 407 feet deep, whereas the tunnel to the northwest is only 260 feet deep. In contrast to other caves where you can enter with your equipment in tow, the shaft requires that you and your gear be lowered into the cave one at a time using a lift system. The eastern tunnel has some obstructions at about 187 feet, which limited further research into the cave, according to the exploration and mapping that was done in 2002 and 2003. However, if you can get past the obstruction, the tunnel descends roughly 407 feet. The tunnel becomes horizontal from this point on and is obstructed by another rock pile. The dazzling shaft of sunlight that reflects on the ground from the surface on sunny days is said to be the source of the name shaft. A group of nine divers arrived at the shaft on May 26, 1973, for a cave diving expedition. The divers included Robert J. Smith, Joan Harper, Larry Reynolds, Gordon G. Roberts, Stephen Millett, Christine M. Millett, and Glenn Millett. The other eight team members had been informed by Joan Harper that she would remain above the water while making hot soup for them and providing any other assistance they might require. The eight divers entered the cave on May 27, 1973, for a pre-exploratory dive. From the cave's entrance all the way down to the water, which is around 150 feet away, they installed a guideline. They arrived at the rock pile right below the cave's entrance. It is a 131-foot-high mound of limestone debris. With the guideline they had earlier fastened to the entrance, they returned to the surface after exploring the rock pile's perimeter. The following day was allotted for the last exploration. The eight divers dove into the water on May 28, 1973, as anticipated, to explore the subterranean cave. At Mount Gambier, they had recharged their cylinders. They quickly arrived at the rock pile that they had previously explored. They initially had no intention of going beyond the edge, a narrow downward sloping extension of the main cavern. Beyond this zone, the entrance is natural light, no longer penetrates the surrounding area. The other areas of the cave have not yet been investigated and are full of silt and limestone debris. Thus, the rock pile turned out to be the safe limit for recreational diving. Except that they have a combination of helium and oxygen in their cylinders, divers will become increasingly susceptible to nitrogen narcosis as they dive to higher depths. The aid divers broke numerous safety regulations. They didn't have a staging tank attached to the guideline for decompression during the return dive, a gas management plan for their dive, a diving companion, or a guideline that extended very far into the cave floor. One of the divers, Glenn Millot, later commented that entering such a small cave with aid rules might have presented more risks than they really faced. The dive did not go to as great depths as Robert Smith, who has dove in this cave around eight times, had anticipated especially for the other team members. When Robert reached the base of the rock pile, he started to experience nitrogen narcosis. This area can occasionally cause the condition, although it is not as severe as going farther into the cave. He checked his depth gauge and saw that he had already descended 180 feet into the cave. He told the other divers that he was going back to the top of the rock pile because he was an experienced diver and was aware of the signs of narcosis. Others signaled to him that they were entering the cave farther. Robert and Glenn met at the base of the rock pile after spending a while circling the area where he had seen others enter the cave. 
Glenn had been monitoring his air supply, and when he realized it could no longer go any lower, he turned around. He saw Christine just as he was about to turn his dive. She swam away as soon as he was ready to grab her by the arm and tell her that he was coming back to the surface. Glenn and Robert came back to the surface together. They saw Larry, who had surfaced before them, as they approached the surface. In the blink of an eye, Peter likewise surfaced with a nearly empty tank. Glenn knew the other four divers would soon run out of air, so he took up a replacement tank and went back into the sea. At 225 feet below the surface, when Stephen's torch and camera were discovered, there was almost no visibility due to the area's siltation. Glenn was unable to continue because of the visibility issue, so he was forced to surface. When he returned to the surface, he ran into an ambulance that the surface divers had requested due to the emergency. In an attempt to locate any of them, Peter returned to the cave, but it too proved fruitless. They all came to the conclusion that the other four divers had little chance of making it out of the cave alive. From the depth they dove to, Robert and Larry observed Gordon and Christine attempting to return to the rock pile. However, they dove straight up in the belief that, because they would have been running out of air, they would discover a way out much more quickly. Sadly, they discovered themselves inside a dome with no way out. Only at that moment could Robert and Larry see the two of them. John was also observed just diving deeper into the cave while having a severe nitrogen narcosis attack. He most likely didn't know he was going to pass away. The police underwater recovery team entered the cave on May 29, 1973, and descended to a depth of roughly 200 feet. Because they had exhausted their diving limits, the search was only conducted briefly, and no bodies of the divers were discovered. They continued their search on May 30, but it was unsuccessful. So, before they could resume their hunt, the police had to travel for scheduled training with experienced naval officers. On January 22 of the following year, 1974, a television film crew visited the location for cave diving. In the lower southeast, they plunged into several caves. So, using a more advanced light, the group plunged down to a depth of around 50 feet, turning the entire cave into bright sunshine. From where he was, one of the crew members peered into the distance and noticed what appeared to be a third person following two of his two dive teams. It turned out to be a dead body in a wetsuit, as they eventually discovered. After reporting what they had witnessed, they went back to the surface. The police divers visited the cave the following day quite early in the morning and dove to the reported depth by this crew. They took the body out after discovering it there at a depth of 50 feet. Stephen Millett's body was identified by a dental record after it was established that his torch and camera were located at a deeper level following the event. No other body of the remaining three divers was discovered when the police surfaced at a depth of 180 feet after their dive. Our G trainer and a group of divers entered the cave on March 9, 1974. They entered with better diving equipment, which would increase the likelihood of a successful retrieval. At a depth of 185 feet, trainer observed a body. He found that there were actually two bodies, one on top of the other. Gordon and Christine were last seen diving together during the incident and it was later discovered that their bodies were among the two found. They must have been holding each other when they realized they wouldn't be able to escape the death that had come knocking because they were discovered beneath each other. Another body was discovered that day as Trainer ventured farther into the cave, roughly 20 feet from where the others had been discovered. John Bockerman's body was found inside. Trainer returned to the surface because he was now out of oxygen and couldn't even collect the dead at a location where they could easily transport them out as he had originally imagined. The divers went back to the cave to retrieve the dead on March 10, 1974, but despite their best attempts, the murky waters prevented them from succeeding. They put the operation on hold until the following day. The bodies of Gordon Roberts and Christine Millot were finally recovered on March 11, 1974. At the depth where they discovered the other two dead, they started to experience the effects of nitrogen narcosis, necessitating their return from the dive. When the rescue operation was abandoned, John Bockerman's body was still lying 215 feet inside the cave. The divers were given a month off to unwind from the pressure and receive further training in order to get ready for the last recovery at the shaft cave system. The rescue of the final body was planned for a three-day operation. They entered the cave on the first day with instructions to locate the body's precise location. They took a day off to recover from any potential nitrogen narcosis symptoms. However, once appearing, the effects could disappear quickly. They returned to the cave the following day to retrieve the body. On the two days they did the dive, 
they displayed signs of nitrogen narcosis. The successful rescue operation was a result of the employment of cutting-edge equipment, adherence to safety protocols, and careful dive planning. They weren't able to find John A. Bockerman's body until April 9, 1974. Since the accident on May 28, 1973, his body had been trapped in the cave for 11 months and 11 days. We appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. If you like what you saw, click the bell icon, like, and subscribe buttons to be notified when we post another thrilling cave diving story.